All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Friday, February 4th, 2022, and we are live. We know it's African American History Month, Black History Month. So I wanted to take a few minutes to do a overview, a preview of the 10-week online class that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You've heard me talk about the class. Some of you have taken it before previously. And class number one is going to start up Saturday, February 5th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I teach this at my online school. So we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So everybody um, share this broadcast and social media platforms. Uh, you're going to learn a lot here and you can register for the uh, online class. We'll post the information here. You can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and uh, register for the online class. It's a 10 week online class that I teach. And um, we, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, everything. Okay. So visit our website, africannetwork.com, and I'll post the information here. So we see that um, African American History Month, Black History Month, we see it's under attack because of these anti critical race theory laws that we see that have been passed in about 14 um, different uh, states so far. OK, and it's making it challenging for teachers. And I was reading an article today about Alabama, how uh, you have a um, in, in Alabama, the uh, Black History Month celebrations are coming under uh, scrut scrutiny by some parents like this article here from uh, AL.com, Alabama.com. Um, Alabama. Alabama officials received complaints about Black History Month as state dates critical race theory legislation. This is from February 3rd, uh, 2022. And then we see also here um, in Alabama, you have an educator had to come out and say that uh, Black History Month teaching African American history is not critical race theory. This is from the Washington Post. Black History Month is not critical race theory, Alabama educator says in response to complaints. All right. Um, as the country celebrates Black History Month, some parents in Alabama are calling education officials to complain to schools that they believe celebrating Black History Month is a way of practicing something else in the classroom, critical race theory. State Superintendent Eric Mackey told members of the Alabama House Education Policy Committee this week that he has received at least two calls from parents in recent days who said they consider celebrating Black History Month a way of educating students on critical race theory, which is an academic framework for examining the way laws and policies perpetuate systemic racism. The issue has been turned into a contentious culture war in which conservatives nationwide have pushed back against racial equity initiatives by schools, including teaching about racism in American history. And um, Eric Mackey uh, told officials Wednesday, he said, there are people out there who don't understand what critical race theory is. And so in their misunderstanding of it, they make a report, but it's not actually critical race theory. He he actually said having a black history program is not critical race theory. And he's absolutely correct. Uh, so check this out here. But when, when we look and see what's taking place across the country, we see these attacks on the teaching of different aspects of history and the history of slavery and African-American history and civil rights history, et cetera. There's this piece from Axios.com that we talked about on my show earlier this week. New rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. This is from, I think, February 1st, 2022. New rules are limiting how teachers can teach Black History Month. So here's some of the things that we deal with in this 10-week online class that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, 
understand the transatlantic slave trade when we when we deal with our history we can't start our history um in slavery we have to deal with thousands of years of history that lead up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place we deal with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley region of Africa. We deal with African, uh, ancient African civilizations. We deal with Ga uh, Ghana, Songhai, Mali, Nubia, uh, Carthage, uh, Namibia, um, uh, ancient Kemet, Zimbabwe, Abyssinia. But a lot of people ask me the question, who was Imhotep? Who was Imhotep? So Imhotep means he who comes in peace in the ancient Medo Nether language. And Imhotep was one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. Uh, Dr. Malefe Keti Asante has a book dealing with um, uh, great African, dealing with uh, African philosophers. And one of them is Imhotep. He talks about, talks about Imhotep, uh, Kagimni, Sanchi, Kunanu, these ancient African philosophers. So Imhotep is known as the father of medicine. And even the father of medicine before Hippocrates, okay, uh, amongst the Greeks, okay, Hippocrates said he was a child of Imhotep and he studied the teachings of Imhotep. So Imhotep was a high priest, physician, architect, mathematician, designer of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara for Nasu Bitti Zosier or Pharaoh Zosier, because Nasu Bitti would be the correct term for the uh, rulers in ancient Kemet. And Kemet won the original names for Egypt. Kemet meaning the land of the blacks. Um, so he was a, 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 an architect for the Step Pyramid for the Subiti Zosia in the third dynasty. He's known as the world's first multi-genius. Okay. So when you look at estimates from when he lived, you'll see anywhere from 2780 BC right around there to about 3000 BC somewhere. Uh, depending upon which timeline of history you're looking at, it can be off by a um, couple hundred years or so. So now these are two famous statues of Imhotep also. All right, now, and you, you'll see um, Imhotep referenced in um, various movies, different things like this. Okay, so this is Imhotep. And this is not Imhotep. This is not Imhotep. In the blockbuster movie in 2001, The Mummy Returns, which was the sequel to The Mummy, one of the villain's name was Imhotep. So consequently, many of our children think that one of our greatest ancestors was evil and not of African descent. So they have in the movie, they have this actor, Arnold Vosloo, this Eurasian Arab looking actor portraying Imhotep. And in the movie, he's a high priest. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why we have to be really careful of the type of images and type of information we allow our children to consume, especially from the television, because this is one of the main ways of programming um, anti-African, uh, anti-Black um, ideology and concepts. In imagery. Now, here's a picture of the Step Pyramid at Saqqara that uh, that Imhotep was the architect of for the Subiti Zosier. All right. And in the in, in the 10 week online class, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, um, all this information. And you still have access to the 10 week, uh, to the, you still have access to the full class even after the 10 week online class is over with. All right. So we have the uh, step pyramid at, uh, at Saqqara. Now, this is one of the early forms of pyramids called a mastaba, flat bench pyramid, mastaba, which is different than the pyramids, than, different than the designs that we see the, of the um, Great Pyramid. And as we see at the pyramid of uh, Men, uh, uh, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkere at the um, at Giza, okay, that are, are more sloped. It's a different design. Is even uh, this is even a different design than the pyramids that we see in uh, Nubia or Tanahesi, okay. And we know that Nubia or Tanahesi is the uh, is, is the mother of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. 
So some other things that we deal with in the class, because we deal with we deal with ancient African history and we do a timeline of history and, and cover thousands of years. We deal with um, Asar Aset and Heru coming out of um, ancient Kemet and, and African mythology. Um, they're known as the first holy trinity, Asar, Aset, and Heru. The Greeks called them Osiris, uh, Isis, and Horus. And we see them uh, involved in a mythology dealing with the Tekken that the Greeks called an obelisk. Um, and the Washington Monument is a Tekken, okay? So here is a famous statue of Osset, the virgin, the mother, with the baby Heru, who the Greeks called Horus, and the Greeks called Osset Isis. And when we look at Notre Dame, Notre Dame Cathedral, Notre Dame meaning, meaning Our Lady. We know that Notre Dame was built on the remains of a temple dedicated to Isis. So Aset, which means her name means She of Throne, She of Throne, was the first queen of, uh, of Kemet, the wife of Asar, mother of Heru. Heru was known as the first Kares, Kares meaning rising of the spirit, Ka meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which comes from ka rest, which is a spiritual concept. Christ is a title, not a name. And in the mythology, we know that Asar, um, um, uh, uh, Aset helps to resurrect Asar after he's killed by his brother Set. His body's cut up into 14 pieces. 13 of those 14 pieces are recovered by Aset. And um, she puts the pieces back together again. He's going to be resurrected. The 14th piece that's missing is the phallus, the penis. And the Tekken, the Tekken, the obelisk, is erected as a symbol of uh, that phallus. Okay, but it's a symbol of resurrection, the Tekken, that, that the Washington Monument is. And, and this is uh, part of Freemasonry, and we know that Freemasonry is a watered-down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on social media platforms. And uh, we're doing a brief overview of a 10-week uh, online class that I teach uh, on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we analyze the transatlantic slave trade as well to better understand our history, better understand ourselves and where we need to go from here as well to understand how we got to where we are. OK, uh, you can register for this class. The, the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Eighty dollars. Uh, we also have have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes for um, $120. And once you register for the class, you have access to it forever. So even after the class is over with a year from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. All right. You can use this with your children as well. I, I would say the content is PG-13. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You scroll down the page, you have the information here. And then uh, on Sundays, I teach um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Class number one starts up Sunday, February 6, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, each class is on sale, $80, regularly $130, but we have the bundle pack. You can register for both classes for $120. As soon as you register, there's bundle that there's bonus content that you can start watching. And with um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, you're going to get uh, 15 bonus lectures from me as well. Uh, the Michael M. Hotep 15 DVD bundle pack, you're going to get this, you're going to get these lectures in digital format uh, when you uh, register for ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Now, if you've taken um, any of our online classes before, any of the online classes I teach, if you've taken any of, any of them before, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Email me 
at AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, you're going to get 50% off. If you've taken any of the online classes with me that I've taught in the past, email me at AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and you can register for these new classes at 50% off. Okay. All right. So we appreciate the support. This helps us keep doing uh, the radio show and keep uh, broadcasting, keep doing the research because there's a lot of work and it costs money to do all of this. All right. So let's continue here. Um, all right. Let's continue. So I'm doing an overview of um, the con some of the content in this 10 week online class that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. I first started teaching this class in uh, about February of 2017, okay? So I've been teaching it on and off since then. It has evolved greatly since 2017. Now, this is uh, another depiction of Osset, who once again, the Greeks called Isis. Uh, her name means she of throne because who sits on the throne in ancient Kemet was determined by the lineage through the woman. Okay. It was matrilineal. Uh, and she's associated with love and fertility. And when we study the deities in Greece and Rome, we're going to see that they're greatly influenced many times by the deities from ancient Kemet. Now from, uh, Osset, the mother who gave birth to Heru, uh, on December 25th, a virgin birth, December 25th, from, from that we get the worship of the Black Madonna and Child that we saw all throughout Europe. The Black Madonna and Child. And one of the books that I deal with use in the class, and you don't have to buy any of these, any of these books. But one of the books I use in the class is from uh, Renoko Rashidi. And we know uh, Renoko passed away August 2nd, 2021. Uh, Black Star, the African, the uh, African, the Black Star, the uh, African presence in early Europe. And let me see where is that right here. Here's another book that we use. Uh, the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class, but I use them for reference. But um, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Fantastic book, which deals with some of the history of the Moors in Europe. And he has um, in here, he has some of the uh, pictures of the Black Madonna and Child worship throughout Europe. OK, this is page 90 of the book. We see the Black Madonna and Child in Switzerland in poland switzerland here poland here uh we see it here in madrid spain so they're worshiping the black madonna and child even before the moors go in in 711 a.d uh black virgin and child statues in saint john's church luxembourg city luxembourg so we can look at a time in history when Europeans were worshiping African people. Okay. And then you wonder what happened. Well, we deal with that history in the class as well. All right. So let's go back to this. How's everybody doing? Okay. So then from the uh, Black Madonna and Child, then we're going to get the decolorized version, the decolorized version. And, and as we see, Europeans coming out of the dark ages in the late 1400s, going into the early 1500s, going into the Renaissance age. And as they're conquering uh, people's land, extracting the mineral wealth out of the land, enslaving people, and they're building Europe back up. As we see a rise in European powers, we see a rise in the dominance of the European phenotype. And we, 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 we start to see these images get reinterpreted as European. So Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel using his uh, aunt and uncle as the, uh, or uncle and aunt as the uh, model for Adam and Eve. And he paints God as being European and paints the angels as being European. As we see a rise in the, in the, uh, the dominance of these European powers, we see a reinterpretation of a lot of these images and we also uh, 
get to see going even going back to about 13th century AD with the Moors in Europe, we start seeing a uh, a resentment, a hostility building up toward the towards the Moors from these Europeans and start seeing a, a suppression of them. All right. Let's continue now. This is from uh, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browley. This is another book that we use in the class. Once again, you don't have to buy any of these books. OK, you can um, you, you, you'll be able to follow follow along. You can get them for your own personal library if you want. And if you have uh, them at home already, you can uh, pull them off your bookshelves because uh, you're going to learn a lot. We're going to show you some things that you probably didn't even know were in those books. But this is from page 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. And um, he talked, this one deals with historic, the historical accomplishment of Kemet. This is the uh, section of the book, the historical accomplishment of Kemet. And it, and it relates ancient Kemet to references in the Bible, but then it gets into the first holy trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru, and how far back in history it dates, okay? So Browder says on page uh, 95, in 1984 at the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, 1984 at the Nile Valley Conference in, in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Charles Kofer, professor of Old Testament at, um, entered the at, at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, discussed the role of Egypt and Ethiopia in the Old Testaments. He stated the following, and I want to pull my book out. Okay, hold on. My book is buried down here. Now, this is a good book to talk about as well. We'll probably reference this in class a little bit. This is about Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, co-founder, co principal founder of, of, of a solid association for the study of Negro life and history, which today is association for the study of African-American life and history. A solid is the governing body of black history month, African-American history month. This is Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., the father of black history. Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., the father of, of black history by Dr. Pay, uh, by, by Dr. Payroll Dak Bovey, who's a history professor at Michigan State University. It's a fantastic book on uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. OK, and we know this year's annual theme for African-American History Month is um, black wealth and uh, black health and wellness black health and wellness this is the annual theme for african-american history month okay there's been an annual theme going back to 1928 a lot of people don't know this uh one of the bonus lectures you're going to get from me in digital format when you register for the class deals with the whole history of african-american history month okay that's part of that 15 uh uh, Michael M. Hotel 15 uh, lecture bundle pack. You can buy it in DVD format, but you're going to get it in digital format for free when you register for this class. All right, let's continue here. So this is page 95 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. All right. So he says in the King James Version and revised standard versions of the Bible, the word Egypt or Mitzrayim in Hebrew, along with cognates, occurs some 740 times, occurs some 740 times. And in the uh, and occurs some 740 times in the Old Testament, the word translated Ethiopia and or Cush, uh, Cush in Hebrew, along with cognates and including three instances of duplication in the references appears 58 times in the King James version. In this version, the translation Ethiopia is used 39 times. Cush untranslated 
with cognates 19 times. The numerous references to Egypt led one Old Testament scholar to remark, quote, no other land is mentioned so frequently as Egypt in the Old Testament. No other land is mentioned so frequently as Egypt in the Old Testament. To understand Israel, one must look well into Egypt. Okay, so then Browder goes on to, so this is this is what Dr. Charles Kofer, professor of Old uh, Old Testament um, at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, said in 1984 at the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So Browder goes on to talk about the story of Asar or set in Heru. And another book we use in the class is Egypt on the Potomac, also by Tony Browder. Browder's a friend of mine as well. So I've interviewed him a number of times. Um, the story of Asar Aset and Heru um, is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Okay. Now, some of this may sound familiar to you. OK, some of this may sound familiar to you. And, and as you go through and study this history, you're going to learn that a lot of things that, you know, originally came from Africa, it, but it's been distorted or reinterpreted and fed back to us. All right. All right, let's continue here. And once again, um, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And if you've taken any of my online classes before, you'll get 50% off. Um, uh, you'll get 50% off the class for uh, previous students as well. And 50% off the bundle pack also. All right, let's continue. And we have this right on the homepage of AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And the link is here in the in the broadcast also, in the description of the broadcast. So the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, the Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection. Evidence of this Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia, as late as 3300 bce before the common era now one of the things we're going to do in the class we go through and we deal with the different types of dating systems and learn the difference between bc and ad and ce common era bce before the common era we deal with the venerable bead who was the one who um popularized the uh bc ad dating system all of that okay we do it we break down all this in the class this is why it's 10 weeks. It's 10 consecutive Saturdays. And uh, we do about two hours. Sometimes we'll go past two hours. You don't have to stay for the whole class. Once again, we do the sessions live. You can join us in class. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Okay. Uh, you, you can go back and watch it anytime. All right. Now, let's continue. So evidence of the Trinity is known to have existed in ancient Nubia as late as 3300 BCE before the common era carved on the walls of the temple of Luxor circa 1380 BC before the common era BCE before the common era, which is equivalent to BC. There's an attempt by many historians, especially African Senate historians to get away from the AD BC dating system. Okay, AD meaning Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. AD does not mean after death. So carved on the walls of the Temple of Luxor, 1380 BCE, are the scenes which depict the following. The Annunciation, the Immaculate Conception, the Virgin Birth, and the Adoration. Okay, which are, which are, uh, ancient African concepts, okay? And when you read books like um, 
Christianity, Christianity before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson of the World 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves. You'll get into this. If you if you read um, um study comparative religion uh in different religions uh, in mithra and hinduism and different things like this you'll see these common themes okay i'm going to show you um i'm going to show you a paper that dr martin luther king jr wrote as well that deals with this because a lot of people don't know dr king was writing about this All right. So the Annunciation that we see at the top, the Netter de Huti is shown announcing to the Virgin or set the coming birth of their son. OK, so we see over to the left. So we see the Netter or deity de Huti, the Netters, the Netteru plural, Netter singular are man different manifestations of the forces of nature. There are different manifestations of that one supreme being that they're, 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 they're um, uh, helpers of the creator, but they're different manifestations of nature. OK, so Dehuti represents divine articulation of speech and writing and science and mathematics. That's Dehuti. It's a, it's a, uh, a deity that has the head of an ibis, uh, the bird, an ibis. So the Netter de Huti is shown announcing to the virgin or set, who the Greeks called Isis, the coming birth of their son, Heru. This is the Annunciation. In the second panel, the second scene, you see what's known as the Immaculate Conception. The Netter Neph, K-N-E-P-H, who represents the Holy Ghost, who represents the Holy Ghost, and the Netter Het Heru, who the Greeks called Hathor, are shown symbolically impregnating or set by holding onx, the, the, the African symbol of eternal life, also known as the symbol of life, the onk. okay? Um, they're holding the onk to the nostrils of the virgin mother-to-be or set, symbolically impregnating her. This is the Immaculate Conception. The third panel at the top, you see the uh, virgin birth. Okay. You see the virgin birth. Osset is shown sitting on the birthing stool, and the newborn child is attended by midwives because we knew that it made more sense to sit on the birthing stool for a woman to sit on the birthing stool and for nature to take its course uh then to lay on your back and try to push the baby up so our set is shown sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives and then the fourth panel at the bottom is the adoration the adoration the newborn heru or who the Greeks call Horus, is portrayed receiving gifts from the three kings or magi while being adored by a host of gods and men. This is an ancient story told over and over again, adapted to various people's cultures. And it goes all around the world. When you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, you see this in... Um, in the, in the in the in the Bible where they talk about the Magi, they don't tell you how many there were. The, the 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 concept of the three kings comes from the three stars in Orion's belt. Orion the hunter, the constellation of Orion the hunter, the three stars in Orion's belt, and we know that um, Orion the constellation was followed by two dogs, Canis Major the big dog and Canis Minor the small dog, the star Sirius. OK, the brightest star in the sky, the star Sirius is in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. And the star Sirius is also referred to as the dog star. Now. You have the. 1970s Saturday morning TV show 
that aired on CBS called The Secrets of ISIS. I used to watch this Saturday morning. I still have comic books from the 1970s that advertised that it was the Shazam and ISIS hour. Came on 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturdays on CBS, the Shazam and ISIS hour. And they showed us this white woman named ISIS. They said, they said she got her powers from ancient Egypt. But they didn't tell us that the ancient Egyptians were Africans. And they show her doing all these fantastic things and flying through the sky. And she's very intelligent and she's saving the world and things like this. But they're co-opting ancient Africa, the symbols, the sun disk and, and the in the uh the the horns of het heru and, and all this stuff they're co-opting ancient africa but they don't tell us that this is why i say will the real isis please stand up because they had us thinking isis was a white woman so isis was right white in ancient egypt isis was white now if we look here at um if we look here, I want to go to this uh, piece here. How's everybody doing? And you can post your comments here. Uh, be sure to register for this online course. Class number one starts up Saturday, February 5th, 2022, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So when you scroll down the page, um, you'll see the online classes. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, which is on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It starts up February 6th. And then uh, also Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, this is 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturdays. Okay, this starts up February 5th as well. Uh, and the other one starts up Sunday, February 6th. So we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only $120. That is a $260 value. The classes are regularly $130 each. They're on sale. If you've taken any uh, of the online classes with me in the past, email me at AHN at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, I'll give you a 50% discount uh, on the classes also for previous students. All right. Okay. And we're going to post a link here. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. We have bonus content here. We have bonus content with both classes. As soon as you register, you start watching the bonus content. You can join us in class um, on the weekend. Now, um, I don't take attendance in class. If you have to leave early or something like that, that's fine. Um, you can watch anytime. You don't have to be present in class. That's fine. You can watch anytime. The, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Even after the class is over with, you still have access to the full course. Okay. And you can, once, like I said, you can use this information with your children as well. Uh, we give you numerous sources, articles, book references, video clips, everything. Okay, so I would say the content is PG-13. All right. Let's continue here. And I have a lot of parents who tell me they're looking for content for their children to use with them. This is this is content you can use with your children. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he was in uh, uh, Crozier Theological Seminary, 1949-1950, he wrote a paper dealing with the influence of the mystery religions on christianity the influence of the mystery religions on christianity and if you've seen some of my presentations i deal with dr king a lot uh this is uh this is his let me do i have this uh, we have this book here this is well this is his first book right here because dr king wrote five books this is his first book, Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, which is all about the Montgomery bus boycott. And then um, he, he wrote it um, in uh, 5th, 1958. This came out in 1958. And he was doing a um, book signing of this book in 58 when he was stabbed in the chest with a letter opener 
by a crazed um, African-American woman named uh, Azola Ware Curry, okay? And he almost died. He had to be hospitalized. He was stabbed in the chest with a letter opener. And um, the doctor said if he had sneezed, he would have died. He was saved by two police officers, one African-American, one white police officer. They, they, they rendered aid to him on the scene, okay? But Stride Toward Freedom, this is his first book. And his, uh, his uh, book here. I have, uh, oh, right here. This one I'm looking for. Where do we go from here? Chaos or Community. This is his last book, probably his best one to me. 1967. Where do we go from here? Chaos or Community. Chapter two. It's called Black Power, where he deals with the Black Power movement. We deal with we deal with that in the second class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We deal with that in that class. Here's the U.S. Constitution. We deal with this in, in that class also, that second class with the U.S. Constitution, Emancipation Proclamation. It's all in this one. The Declaration of Independence and other great documents of American history, 1775 to 1865. So we deal with that in the second class all right but let's look at this here quickly the influence of the mystery religions on christianity by dr martin by martin luther king jr okay he didn't have his doctorate at this point um king wrote this paper for the for the course development of christian ideas taught by uh davis the essay examines how Christianity developed as a distinct religion with a set of central tenets and how it was influenced by those pagan religions it assimilated, so-called pagan religions, okay? King repeats material from an earlier paper, A Study of Mithraism. Well, what you're going to see is that Christianity is influenced by these previous religions, especially the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, Okay. Um, all right. So when, when you actually study, we actually study the history of this. All right. So he goes through, he talks about the mystery religions, things like that. Um, and I want to get to this part here. Okay. The influence of the cult of, uh, Sybil and Attis. But if we go, okay. He talks about Adonis, the influence of Adonis. Another one, the crucified saviors right here. The influence of Osiris and Isis. The influence of Osiris and Isis. The Egyptian mysteries of Isis and Osiris exerted considerable influence upon early Christianity. And early Christianity looked a lot like, now what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it, does not mean it's not true it just means you have to do some research to understand what i'm talking about okay early christianity looked very similar to traditional african spiritual systems you had um a lot of early christians who believed in a form of reincarnation all right now these two great egyptian deities whose worship passed into Europe were revered not only in Rome, but in many other centers where Christian communities were growing up, where Christian communities were growing up. Osiris and Isis, so the legend runs, were at one and the same time brother and sister, husband and wife. But Osiris was murdered, his coffin body being thrown into the Nile River, and shortly afterwards, the widowed and exiled Isis gave birth to a son, Horus, Heru. Meanwhile, the coffin was washed up on the Syrian coast and became miraculous, miraculously lodged in the tree of a trunk, in the trunk of a tree. This tree afterwards chased a uh, chance to be cut down and made into a pillar in the palace at Byblos. And there is Isis at length found uh, at length found it after recovering osiris dismembered body 
Isis restored him to life and installed him as king in the netherworld. Meanwhile, Horus, having grown to manhood, reigned on earth, later becoming the third person of the Egyptian trinity. Later becoming the third person of the Egyptian trinity. Okay, now who wrote this? This paper is by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1949. When he's at Crozier Theological Seminary. This is at the um, Stanford University, the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute, where they have a lot of his papers there that you can read. So Dr. King knew this back in 1949, 1950. And and when they go through the when they go through the seminary, for those that don't know, when they go through the seminary, they take classes on comparative religions so they learn about these different religions now how much they tell you that they know about these different religions and osiris and isis and horus and all this coming out of ancient came how much they tell you well that's on them some of them some of them are more honest than others some of it may depend upon you know which direction they want to go in but they learn this in the seminary So then we, we deal with different uh, Neturu, different deities, things like this, like Ma'at, the, uh, who is the personification of truth, justice, righteousness, balance, harmony, order, and reciprocity. The winged deity Ma'at, who the, who the angels are actually patterned after. Uh, female winged deity uh, Netur, the personification of truth, justice, righteousness, balance, harmony, order, and reciprocity. The 42 laws of Ma'at are a precursor to the Ten Commandments. The 42 laws of Ma'at are a precursor to the Ten Commandments. So we deal with um, ancient history and we deal with uh, some information from Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And we deal with the Khoisan and the African presence in the Americas going back over 50,000 years ago, over 50,000 years ago including in this land that we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years ago. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the, on the planet. Um, they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They come from Southern Africa. There's uh, a number of articles written on the uh, Khoisan. And Face-to-Face -face Africa uh, has an article uh, on the Khoisan dealing with um their fight against amazon amazon.com if we look at this here quickly from uh face to face africa africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep ancestral land away from amazon reach africa's oldest Africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep ancestral land away from Amazon reach. This is from June 4th, 2021 from uh, face to face Africa.com. And this deals with uh, the Khoisan. Amazon is looking to build its new African headquarters in Cape Town, South Africa a project that will take between three and five years. However, the land on which the multi-billion dollar corporation seeks to put its edifice belongs to the local Khoisan people, the local Khoisan people reputed to be the oldest existing people in the world. Since the project was announced a few years ago, the Khoisan people by conservationists have appealed to the project to the uh, have appealed to have the project rejected because of the sensitive matter of Khoisan culture. What ensued was a clash of ideas to respect the traditions and identity of a people or to give away or to give way to the ambitions of one of the most prosperous businesses ever founded. So check out the rest of this here. This deals with the Poisson.
This is from face to face Africa.com. Africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep ancestral land away from Amazon reach. So if we look at this here, this is from page 14 of Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Now, his new book is out now, came out two or three months ago. The First Americans Were Africans Revisited um, or Revised. That's, that's his new book. It's revised and expanded. And it's available at Amazon.com. You may be able to find it at your local African-American bookstore also. But uh, evidence of an... So, there was a discovery made in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the uh, University of South Carolina. He's a white archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And a lot of his research and discoveries, especially this one here that he did, is being attacked by mainstream archaeologists because his uh, this discovery is blowing all this other stuff out of the water and is pushing the timelines back and putting an African presence in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago before Native Americans came into existence. So evidence of an African presence 51,700 years ago in a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina, discovered by archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear, he found 13 different types of evidence, 13 different types of evidence documenting an African presence in the territory we call South Carolina going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence. Now, Dr. David M. Hotep's book has 713 footnotes. Okay, so it's thoroughly documented and backed up by seven peer-reviewed peer articles as well. Now, this is not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. Yes, it did. But you have to understand thousands of years of history before the transatlantic slave trade happened. They have to understand that African people were in this land because we had already migrated from Africa much thousands of years before we were told. And we were making voyages back and forth from Africa to here. Uh, and we see seafaring in the Mediterranean going back about 130,000 years ago as well. The discovery that uh, New York Times talks about in 2010 on the Greek island of Crete. But here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. I'm going to show you another article because one of the things that we do within the class are we deal with archaeological discoveries. And a lot of these archaeological discoveries that are coming out that are causing the scientists and paleontologists to rethink everything. And, and, and the discoveries are coming out every week or every other week. OK, there's a lot of information coming out. Um, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments contained in these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age now this is an article from sciencedaily.com okay sciencedaily.com is a scientific website they have scientific discoveries there things like this archaeological discoveries this is from november 18th 2004 sciencedaily.com the article's still there you can go read it all right how many people have never seen, have never heard of this discovery, have never seen this article. Okay. So this article came out in 2004. All right. It's like 18 years ago. Okay. Let's continue here. And if you need me to post a link uh, to register for the class again, just let me know. It's also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. 
Now, the Khoisan, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine, found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly known or formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique. So early uh, uh, genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. All right, but we deal with ancient civilizations. We deal with, and we talk about the Khoisan. We talk about, you know, Carthage and Nubia, ancient Kemet, uh, Zim, uh, Great Zimbabwe. We deal with Ghana, Songhai, Mali. We deal with the, so we deal with different aspects of this history and we go through and look at a chronology of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade and look at what leads to the transatlantic slave trade happening especially the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we go through, look at this history chronologically. Now, this article here, I just talked about this. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. Now this is from the New York Times, February 15th, 2010. This was a big discovery. And this deals with, um, on the Greek island of Crete, they did, excavations over the course of two summers and archaeologists say that they have found that they found stone tools this is 12 years ago archaeologists uh, said they found stone tools that date back 130,000 years ago now Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years which means that they had to sail there and this basically puts uh sailing in the Mar mediterranean maritime voyaging this pushes it back more than a hundred thousand years than the archaeologists and scientists were originally thinking that people were sailing crete has been an island for more than five million years meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat so this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100 more than 100,000 years specialists in stone age archaeology say previous artifacts artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus a few other greek islands and possibly sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago this discovery here over the course of two summers okay they found numerous stone tools. This blows the 12,000 years ago. That blows that out the water. It, they're talking about at least 100, 130,000 years ago. So, um, and we know that at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen also. And this is an, one of the examples of that. Now, Uh, another so so the numerous archaeological discoveries that we deal with in the class to help lay a foundation. This is another one that I talk about. This one came out in 2017, and this flipped the archaeological world upside down. This is an article from NBC News. All the all the news outlets had stories on this washington post new york times all of them i have a file folder of archaeological discoveries so we go through we look at a number of these archaeological discoveries in the class we're older than we thought new find pushes human origin back 100 100 000 years new find pushes human origin back 100 000 years now, this is from June 7th, 2017. This is from five years ago. How many people have not heard about this discovery? This was in Morocco. Okay. This was in Morocco. How many people have not heard about this discovery? And it was flipping the archaeological world upside down.
All right, let's look at this. So modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought. Researchers reported on uh, uh, Wednesday in uh, June 2017. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals. Hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago. A hundred thousand years earlier than scientists have believed until now. See, at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen. Now, this blew the oldest discovery that they had of uh, Homo sapien fossils that date back 195,000 years ago. This discovery blew that out, the, blew that out the water. The site near Morocco's coast in the city of Makarek has always yielded interesting has always yielded interesting human remains but they'd been dated to around 40,000 years dated to around 40,000 years ago new discoveries and new dating methods show that in fact many of the bones belong to modern homo sapiens and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago. The earliest previous Homo sapien, Homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago. And they're uh, from clear across the continent in modern day Ethiopia. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone thought modern humans were dispersed across africa long before anyone ever thought so then they so then they uh, go on to deal with how they have to start looking for evidence in areas they never thought to look before Writing in the journal Nature, and Journal Nature is one of the journals that posts these archaeological discoveries. Uh, Hublin and colleagues argue the scales belong to clearly modern humans, even if the head shape is a little longer and narrower than those of modern people. As with all scientific discoveries, they are throwing out evidence for debate and discussion. No single story is ever the last word on an issue. The team dated the team dated tools and bones to between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago. This evidence makes Jebel Erha, Erhad the oldest and richest African Middle Stone Age homonym site that documents early stages of the Homo sapiens clade. Okay, so check out the rest of this uh, article here. Um, okay, and then they go on to talk about how earlier this year, in 2017, a team argued they have found evidence that modern humans or pre-humans were in North America 150,000 years ago. That dealt with the Mastodon skeleton discovery in California. And the scientists and archaeologists are saying this puts humans in California 130,000 years ago. That's another discovery that came out in 2017 also. Okay, so check this out. We're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. So these these archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. I can't even keep up with them. There's so many coming out. All right. So this is just an overview of some of the information we deal with in the online class. Hold on. Let me back up. I skipped over some things. All right. 
so we have this here. Now, another discovery you deal with is Tanis Heraklion. Tanis Heraklion is the lost city of Egypt. This was a city that was swallowed into the sea. Tanis Heraklion was built about 8th century BC. Okay. And um, April, April 30th, 2013, Yahoo News had a story about this, about the sunken Egyptian city uh, that in, in this, this, um, this, archaeological discovery um, revealed 1,200-year-old secrets. The Telegraph, which is a publication out of the UK, reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 64 ships, 16-foot-tall statues, statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins, and smaller artifacts. Now, the lead archaeologist um, Frank Gaudio estimates that Tanis Heraklion was built around 8th century BC. Now, here are some of the uh, discoveries that they made, some of the archaeological discoveries that they made in this find. Okay, they found 16 foot tall statues. This is from ancient Egypt. Then we look at um, Freemasonry and some of the origins of Freemasonry and the symbols coming out of ancient Kemet and those symbols that we see in Freemasonry and that we see here in the U.S. One of them is the Tekken that the Greeks call the obelisk, and that's what the Washington Monument is. So the word Mason is derived from the Latin, word, Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light which is a metaphor for the sun which symbolizes knowledge the term child of light and or, or sons and daughters of light the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to um, identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of going to um, college institutions of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of steps or degrees comes out of ancient Kemet, that comes out of ancient Africa. In the concept of liberal arts, liberal arts colleges, that comes out of ancient Kemet as well. Um, in George G.M. James' book, um, Stolen Legacy, he deals with the seven liberal arts, the, the uh, rhetoric and the logic and the arithmetic, things like this, the trivium and the quadrivium. So these are all ancient principles. Okay, check out pages 18 and 32 of uh egypt on the potomac by tony browder which is a brilliant brilliant book that really go in egypt on the potomac deals with how the layout of washington dc is based upon ancient african principles coming out of ancient kemet okay this is uh the foundation of egypt on the potomac we know that 50 of the 56 signers of the declaration of independence were freemasons also And we know that uh, the Knights Templar that developed during the Second Crusades about 1118 AD in Europe, we know the Knights Templar are studying the teachings from the African Moors and the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe and, and these teachings bring Europe out of the Dark Ages and it's going to be to our detriment. 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons and 13 of the 30 uh, nine signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons also. Uh, so check out page 18 of Egypt on the Potomac. So we deal with things like the Black Death, the bubonic plague, because we go throughout history, okay? So in this class here, we deal with thousands of years of history. It's a 10-week online class. Each session is about two hours. Sometimes we go past that. You don't have to stay in class the whole time. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. The Black Death, the bubonic plague, is going to um, 
it hits in 1347. It hits in spurts from 1347 to 1400. Um, it's going to, Europe loses between one quarter to one third of the population. Estimate Estimates are between 25 million and 75 million people die. One of the uh, worst plagues in history arrived in Europe's shores in 1347. Nearly 700 years after the Black Death swept through Europe, it still haunts the world as the worst case scenario for an epidemic called the Great Mortality as it, as it caused its devastation. The second great pandemic of bubonic plague became known as the Black Death in the late 17th century. So we deal with uh, things like that to go through history and really understand how because historical events don't happen in the vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to other events taking place. Uh, check out this article here, The Black Death from History.com, official website of the History Channel. Now, we also deal with the film Black Panther. You know how the film Black Panther relates to African history, African culture, language, spiritual systems, things like this. Um, in Mansa Musa, the Emperor of Mali, becomes Emperor of Mali in 1312 AD. He's the richest man in, in the history of the world. There's a good article from history.com that shows the parallel, the comparison, uh, the similarities between Mansa Musa and T'Challa, who is the king of Wakanda uh, in Black Panther. In the vast fictional universe of Marvel Comics, T'Challa, better known as Black Panther, is not only king of, of Wakanda, he's also the richest superhero of them all. And although uh, today's fight for the title of wealthiest person alive involves a tug of war between billionaire CEOs, the wealthiest person in history, Mansa Musa, has more in common with Marvel's first black superhero. Mansa Musa became ruler of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD, common era, taking the throne after his predecessor, Abu Bakr II, for whom he had served as deputy, went missing on a voyage he took by sea to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Mansa Musa's rule came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. During that period, the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt. Now, this is the History Channel telling you that West Africa is thriving at a time when Europe is in disarray and dealing with poverty and filth and civil war. Now, this article came out the month after the film Black Panther came out. Black Panther debuted February 16th, 2018. This came out March 19th, 2018. The, this 14th century African emperor remains the richest person in history. It's about Mansa Musa. This is from the History Channel telling us this. When we look at, uh, in the film Black Panther is deep on multiple levels. I've done uh, a number of different lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. And uh, I did uh, about three months of research and I read um, over 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther and the comic book. I studied the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book to understand characters and storylines and different things like this, because we see some of this represented in the film. OK, so there was two books on Black Panther that I read as well. When we look at the the deity Bast. OK, the deity Bast and Black Panther coming from Bastet. This is a netter from ancient Kemet. Ancient uh, Kemetic goddess or ancient Egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness and later a cat. Bastet was a goddess of warfare or a netter of warfare in lower Kemet, lower Egypt, worshipped as early as the second dynasty, 2890 BCE, before the common era. We see a lot of this represented in the film black panther and in in the class and in my lectures we deal with what the word wakanda means wakanda is an ancient word okay uh we deal with bantu because kiswahili 
is a Bantu language. The word Wakanda is in is uh, Bantu as well. The language spoken in the film Black Panther is Isikosa. Isikosa is spoken in Southern Africa. Isikosa is a Bantu language. So what is Bantu? Bantu languages are a group of some 500 African languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Banu Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa, from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent down in South Africa. Twelve Bantu languages are spoken by more than five million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Isikosa. Isikosa is the language spoken in the film Black Panther and Zulu or Amazulu in Swahili or Kiswahili. Uh, now, Kiswahili is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language. It's a Bantu lingua franca, important in both commerce and literature. All right. So the different sources you can look at for Bantu, uh, what is Bantu and understanding Bantu languages. One place you can start, uh, Britannica.com has, has some good information on uh, Bantu languages. Now, the word Wakanda, we see in the Omaha Ponca language and Sioux Indian language. It means possesses secret powers. And it's also a Bantu word as well. Okay, so Wakanda is an ancient word. And there's a Wakanda Water Park in Wisconsin. Uh, the schools named after uh, named Wakanda also, like in Nebraska. So we deal with different uh, African civilizations will go through the, uh, through our history to get a better understanding of all this history. We look at Carthage and 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 uh, the uh, Punic Wars and Hannibal Barca and uh, the Battle of Kanai 216 BC. We look at the uh, Kingdom of Great Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, uh, Axum. Uh, we look at Kush, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. A lot of this, and then we. We look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who take the teachings from ancient Kim and ancient Egypt into Europe. It's going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. We're going to see what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. The Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1441. OK, um, and we know that the Moors lose control of the, of the last stronghold in uh, in Spain was uh, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Um, the Moors light of Europe's dark age. This is an excerpt from an article that, uh, Renoko Rashidi wrote, uh, according to the Oxford English dictionary, the Moors as early as the middle ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy. And hence the word is often used for negro early in the 18th century. After a grim and extended, I'm sorry, early in the eighth, early in the eighth century, after a grim and extended resistance to the Arab invasions of North Africa, the Moors joined the triumphant surge of Islam. Following this, they crossed over from Morocco over to the Iberian Peninsula, which today is Spain and Portugal. It wasn't called Spain and Portugal back in 711 AD, where their where their swift victories and remarkable feats soon became the substance of legends now one of one of the books we use in the class another book that we use in the class is this one here golden age of the moor edited by dr ivan van sertima golden age of the moor fantastic book dealing with the history of the moors now in july 17 uh common era tarif with 400 foot soldiers and 100 horses, all Berbers, successfully carried out a mission in southern Iberia, southern Iberia, Tarif, an important uh, tariff or Tarif, an important city, a port city in southern Spain is named after him. It is clear, however, that the conquest of Spain was undertaken upon the initi initiative of Tariq ibn Ziyad. Tariq was in command 
of an army of at least 10,000 men. Here's a depiction of Tariq, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. In 711 AD, Common Era, the bold Tariq crossed the straits and disembarked near a rock promontory, which from that day since has borne his name, Jebel Tariq, which means Tariq's mount, is more commonly called the Rock of Gibraltar. The Rock of Gibraltar is named after Tariq. Now, in August 711 Common Era or 711 AD, Tariq won paramount victory over the opposing European army. On the eve of the battle, Tariq is alleged to have roused his troops with the following words. My brethren, the enemy is before you. The sea is behind. Whither would ye fly? Follow your general. I am resolved either to lose my life or to trample on the prostrate king of the Romans. Wasting no time to relish his victory, Tariq pushed on with his dashing and seemingly tireless Moorish cavalry to the Spanish city of Toledo. Toledo. Within a month's time, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad had effectively terminated European dominance of the Iberian Peninsula. Okay. This is a uh, from a great article uh, that Renoko Rashidi wrote. And I interviewed Renoko um, back in 2014 about this article and about, about um, his book, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe, which once again, one of the books we use in the class as well. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. You can buy them if you want to, but you don't have to buy any of these books. But I use them as reference. Okay, uh, this is an excerpt from an article, Moors, Saints, Knights, and Kings, the African Presence in Medi Medieval and Renaissance Europe uh, from AtlantaBlackStar.com, June 1st, 2014 by Renoko Rashidi. All right, so we deal with the uh, bubonic plague, Black Death as well. Uh, we deal with Christopher Columbus. It's important to really study Columbus because Columbus helps to expand and you know lay the foundation and, and expand slavery racism capitalism the exploitation of indigenous people when we look at where columbus went on his four voyages he never came to the land that we call the united states of america he goes into uh the bahamas and cuba and hispaniola haiti we know the western third of the island of hispaniola is where aiti or haiti is um, he set sail August 3rd, 1492 in the Nina Dependent of Santa Maria. He goes into the West Indies and Trinidad and Venezuela and uh, Panama, Honduras, but he never comes to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. Now, what is the transatlantic slave trade? The transatlantic slave trade is the forced journey of African people from Europe to Africa, uh, to the Americas, trinkets from Europe exchange for Africans or used uh, for money to, or they use money to purchase them. It lasts from about the 1440s to 1865 or so. Um, and what's the middle passage? The middle passage is the leg of the triangular trade from Africa to the Americas manufactured goods such as rum textiles weapons gunpowder etc were taken from europe to africa in exchange for africans who would become slaves uh or for gold and silver the slaves were then sold the africans were then sold in the americas the caribbean etc for raw materials such as sugar molasses uh, which was turned into rum tobacco later on cotton and also for fish flour and foodstuffs we know there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. There are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts. We were the we were the blacksmiths, the coppersmiths, engineers, bricklayers, uh, anchor makers, artists, decorative furnishers, uh, locksmiths, hunters, horse trainers, basket makers, bartenders. Uh, this comes from a book that came out in 1978, Crafts, Artisans, Skills, Slaves, uh, I'm sorry, uh, The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans, and Craftsmen, 1978 by James Newton and Ronald Lewis. 
And at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, they have a display in there. They have a uh, a, a piece in their main display. It's, it's on the wall, but their, their main display is called And Still We Rise. They have a display on the wall that lists all these skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865. It's, it's 262 of them, okay? So I was at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History here in Detroit a few years ago, and um, I was going through the exhibit, and I saw um, this display on the wall, okay? So there was a sign there that said you couldn't take you couldn't um, take pictures. So I went home, got a pen and a pad, and I went back. I went home, got a pen and a pad, went back, and I wrote them all down. Okay, and that's how I know they're um, 262 because I numbered them. They weren't numbered, but I wrote them all down. And I'm trying to see. I have a copy of. Um, I made some copies. Where is it? Where is that? Hold on. Should be in my folder here. I have a binder here for the class. But I have. Um, I know I have that somewhere here. It's in one of these stacks. And I have two binders, one for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And the other one is for uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, I have to find, I'm not sure where it is. It's in one of these stacks here. But there was at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that uh, African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And then after slavery ends, chattel slavery ends 1865, that's when you're going to see a lot of the large labor unions uh, being created, like the National Labor Union in 1866. They're creating, they're creating these labor unions to protect these jobs for white men and lock African-Americans out of these jobs that we have been doing for free, largely for free for 246 years. Then you're going to see the uh, American Federation of Labor created about 1875. All right, I got to have to find it. It's in one of these stacks here. But anyway, all right. So uh, this is just a brief overview. It's over uh, about 200 slides or something like that in the in the present in the class. We also deal with Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, those three great West African uh, civilizations. All right. So um, be sure to uh, register for this 10 week online class. And we know that. Uh, when we do the Wakanda salute is always right over left. That's a, a, a symbol of power. Uh, we see it amongst the Nisubiti, the pharaohs, okay? And we see it goes all around the world. The Wakanda salute, is it comes straight out of ancient Kemet, okay? When you see them do the Wakanda salute in the film Black Panther, you notice uh, 99 times out of 100 is always right over left. OK, it's always right over left that comes straight out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. OK, here it is right here. Here's a copy of it. All right. Uh, a working life, African-American occupations. So I wrote this down from at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. All these occupations, everything starts with anchor makers. And it's in alphabetical order. Anchor makers, it goes down to barrel makers, bartenders, 
butchers, cabinet makers, chain makers, midwives is 147, masons, mariners, map make map makers, machinists. These were all skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. Ship builders is 201. Okay, see, this is this is the type of this is the type of history we do within the class. Yoke makers, two hundred and sixty-two. There were, there were at least two hundred and sixty-two skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from sixteen nineteen to eighteen sixty-five. But we, but once again, we were here. Even before Europeans came to this land, we were here even before Native Americans came into existence. And another book that we use in the class is Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. And the whole way that slavery evolved here in the 13 colonies is different than the way we think it evolved. Because in 1641, uh, well, in 1619, you didn't even have codified slave laws here in the, here in the U.S., it wasn't here in the 13 colonies. When uh, August, we deal with August 20th, 1619, and the 20 and odd Africans on the white line pirate ship that comes into Jamestown, Virginia. You didn't even have codified slave laws in any of the 13 colonies at that point. The first colony to have codified slave laws is Massachusetts in 1641. The whole way this history evolves is totally different than how we think it happened. All right, so visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down the page. We have the information for the online class. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history. It's a very, it's a visual class. It's going to blow you away. Um, these classes on sale regularly, 80, uh, it's, it's on sale $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. And in the second class that I teach uh, is on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865-1968. We start at about 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and deal with history. We do with the... Uh, what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We deal with uh, uh, the Civil War, the Reconstruction, 1865, 1877, Jim Crow era. We deal with the 1880s, 1890s, Great Migration, 1915, World War I, 1914, 1918, Red Summer, 1919. Um, we deal with uh, the Great Migration, 1915, 1970, World War II, uh, we do the rise of Hitler in 1933, becomes German chancellor. Uh, we do a World War One, um, and then uh, we deal with uh, the baby boomer generation. Um, and then we do a civil rights movement and black power movement. OK, from the Civil War to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865, 1968. Each class we go through and analyze about a 10 to 15, 20 year period of history to understand what happens, what happened after slavery ended, how uh, a lot of our rights were reversed after Reconstruction ends in 1877 and white supremacists take back control of the state legislatures and they, they, and they uh, changed the state constitutions like the Mississippi State Constitution in 1890, South Carolina State Constitution 1895, Louisiana 1898, Alabama 1901. They're changing these state constitutions and there are uh, legalizing poll taxes and literacy tests. They're putting this into the state constitutions to suppress the African-American vote and uh, vote us out of office because there were 2,000, approximately 2,000 African-American men who got elected to public office during Reconstruction. So we're going to see this attack on our voting rights 
after Reconstruction ends, but also uh, they're passing laws to segregate public accommodations and streetcars, things like this. We see this in 1881 with the state legislature in Tennessee and, and uh, uh, segregating uh, streetcars and things like this. And we're going to see other states do the same thing. And Louisiana does it uh, about 1890. Louisiana does it, which leads to uh, 1892 Homer Plessy, uh on a railroad car refusing to go to the colored section, which leads to the Plessy versus Ferguson U.S. Supreme Court case 1896 that legalizes separate but equal in the Jim Crow laws. All right, so we posted a link here. You can register for the class. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Now, remember, if you've taken this class before or we've taken any of the online classes that I teach uh, before, uh, email me at ahnshow at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, ahnshow at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll give you a 50% off discount. We'll also give you a discount on the um on the bundle pack as well because the bundle pack you can register for both classes for um 120 dollars but if you're taking these classes before you get um a discount on that and there's there's a uh, bonus lectures that you get from me as well okay uh so we have the bundle pack here for a limited time only you can register for both classes for only 120 dollars and with um Understand the transatlantic slave trade. When you register for that, you get the uh, 15 bonus lectures from me as well. OK, the uh, Michael M. Hotep um, 15 lecture bundle pack. We have it in DVD format, but you'll get the uh, digital form. You get the lectures, lectures in digital format for free when you register for um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade with it didn't teach you in school. Um, if you like this type of information, also, you can support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting the radio show. I'm on six days a week, uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. Uh, to Eastern Standard, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. And then also on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. And we broadcast here on uh, Facebook and YouTube when I'm on live. I'm also on Roland Martin Unfiltered as a panelist every Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Media Network and on Facebook and YouTube, Roland Martin on Facebook and YouTube. Download the Black Star Media app to your uh, smartphone, to your devices. Also download the iHeartRadio app. Search for the African History Network show because you can listen to the audio podcast of our shows and broadcasts as well. Okay. And we're on uh, 10 different audio podcast platforms, iHeartRadio, iTunes, CastBox, FM Player, TuneIn. Uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. And you can advertise with the African History Network as well. Our current promotion uh, for a very limited time only is buy one month, get two months free. Okay, so African-American business owners, uh, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast and email us at ahnshow at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Thanks for joining us. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. You can follow me on Instagram also, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, uh, on Instagram. Register for the classes. We'll see you in class. Remember, right now is correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Um, and um, you can also sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter also. All right. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. And we'll see you in class. Peace. <laughs>